online. Can you trust they are who they say they are? I keep thinking so much about you. She's so stunning. It's all well planned. Love, Janessa is the true crime podcast from the BBC World Service and CBC Podcasts, exploring the world of online romance scams. And it's available now. Find it wherever you found this podcast. Welcome to The Inquiry. I'm Charmaine Cozier. Each week, four expert witnesses, one question and an answer. There were other social network sites existing at the time that Facebook started. Judith Donath is a faculty fellow at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University. And in 2004, it was five classmates at Harvard who launched that game-changing website. At first, they called it the Facebook after a paper directory of photos and bios used by students to get to know each other on campus. A physical one is not searchable, you can't comment on it, it's a static object. So to move it online, it would be not only convenient, but it would also be a far more flexible medium. The founders of the Facebook included a computer science and psychology student called Mark Zuckerberg. He had bigger plans for it. It was initially just at Harvard, and then he began rolling it out at other university campuses. And it continued to roll. Because Something like this, the more of your friends who are on it, the more valuable it is. Students have their own personal networks outside of the university. If they want to bring in friends who aren't students, other family members, etc., it would have to expand beyond just college addresses. And in 2006, that's exactly what happened. By then, it was known as Facebook and found itself jostling for global attention alongside bigger and more popular names. There was MySpace, there was Friendster, there had been several others, but most of them were very focused on the network aspect. So you would get online, you would list who your friends were, they were still kind of static. You would build out this set of connections and they would show you who were your friends of a friend of a friend of a friend. Spotting an opportunity to elevate the experience of communicating with people online, Facebook added a new feature, the newsfeed. The major attraction that distinguished it from the other networking sites that existed then was its emphasis on being able to see something about what other people were doing. I believe Facebook was the first one to do the kind of prompting, you know, what are you up to now? What's going on? What's happening? And that that would get broadcast to a network and it would be this kind of daily buzz around people and their everyday comings and goings and what they're doing and what they're thinking and what they're eating, etc. Many of us don't think twice about doing that now, but at the time it was a radical move. I think there were a lot of, you know, for a network site, good decisions that Mark Zuckerberg made, particularly in the early design, in understanding that people were really curious about what other people that they know did. There's a concept called um, context collapse, which says you may have your colleagues at work, you have your family, you have friends from different aspects of your life, but they often don't overlap. And you may tell people one thing that you would never say to others. On Facebook, it's very, very 
difficult, especially if you're not talking within a closed group. You put something out on your page, it's probably going to be seen by most of the people you're friends with. And I think that really changed a lot of the dynamic around what people expected to know about each other. Success was swift. Within four years, MySpace was trailing behind Facebook. More social networking sites have appeared since then, but Facebook remains in a league of its own. There's nothing that's exactly like them. You know, there's some like Twitter, but their network structure is very different. Things like TikTok are about quick videos and much less about a network and much more about an algorithm that chooses what you'll see. Facebook's fourth quarter financial results came out in January. It revealed users increased by 39 million, meaning 2 billion people use Facebook daily. So how do they make their money? Part 2. Cash for clicks. Facebook is owned by a company that also used to be called Facebook. Then, in 2021, it changed its name to Meta Platforms, or Meta for short. Its main activity is really advertising. It's basically 98% of its revenue that Facebook generates. Dr. Marlene Komorowski is Professor for European Media Markets at the Flemish Free University of Brussels. She's also Senior Research Fellow for the Media Company Programme at Cardiff University. It was built from the very beginning on the advertising strategy. So our attention pays for us being able to use Facebook and these social media platforms. Meta's growth isn't all homegrown. It also buys companies. Acquisitions include Instagram and WhatsApp, along with their millions of users around the world. Basically, Meta built a whole ecosystem of data gathering across all of these different platforms. So, for example, you might want to register for a website. You click use my Facebook login to do it. These are all ways that Facebook collects a lot of data from us. And then they use this as making the advertising more meaningful for their users. Targeted ads are also more lucrative for Facebook because it gets paid when users engage with ads on the site. A formula called a conversion rate is used to calculate how much it gets. The more people clicking on advertising, they might go to the website, then purchase a, a product from that website. That means the higher the advertising revenue. If less people lock in every day, that also, of course, means that less money is being made through these conversion rates. Its financial results reveal revenue has fallen for three consecutive quarters. But the latest quarterly figure, $32 billion, was better than analysts had expected. Total revenue for 2022 was just over $116 billion. Facebook has billions of users, but teenagers seem to be avoiding it. And that's a considerable threat to future income. The biggest user group is between the age of 25 and 34. That's almost a quarter of all of the users of Facebook. But you can see a lot of people even above 65 are using it. So they have across all of the different social media platforms actually one of the oldest demographics. And is that good or bad for advertisers? Depends. You have, of course, different advertisers who are looking for different kind of demographics but generally if you don't manage as a social media platform to reach younger audiences this could mean that you are losing your users over the long term and you become less and less relevant. Most of Meta's revenue comes from Facebook digital advertising which sounds like a risky strategy. I believe that for a social media company to be sustainable and grow on the long term, it needs to diversify its revenue streams and it needs to look into new business models. As an example, you can buy phones from Google. There are so many different services you can pay for. And Facebook, on the other hand, is only advertising. And advertising always goes up and down depending on where advertisers uh, want to spend money, depending on the economic situation. It's really difficult to just be built on one strand of revenue. So Meta rebranded, restructured and is investing tens of billions of dollars on the Metaverse. It's a concept older than social media, so despite the name, Meta didn't come up with it. 
It's difficult to describe what the metaverse is because it doesn't exist. The broad idea is an immersive digital world where you work, play, learn and connect with other people. It's going to take years and a lot more money before we know if Meta's efforts have paid off. They definitely have the funds and resources to try and test. I just saw they are going to spend about 20% of their investment now into that area. But it doesn't make at all 20% of their revenue at the moment, it's 2%. Ads are also expected to feature heavily in the metaverse. Meta's management theme for 2023 is the year of efficiency. Its CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, says he's focused on becoming a stronger and more nimble organisation. Late last year, Meta confirmed plans to cut 11,000 jobs. That's 13% of its staff. It's a difficult situation at the moment for Facebook having to decide, do we want to properly invest and make this work or do we need to cut costs because we are losing revenue um, with our user numbers as well. And it's a strategy moment right now. They have to make the right decision and it's not clear what is the right decision, to be honest. Part three, move fast and break things. Facebook has gotten into trouble on an international scale so many times, it's hard to remember when it first started. I think the biggest recent event, if you can call it recent, was probably the 2018 Cambridge Analytica scandal. Tiffany Lee is an assistant professor at the University of New Hampshire School of Law. So with Cambridge Analytica, this was really an issue of access permissions. Facebook allowed a number of third-party developers to access Facebook data. So advertisers could use your data, for example, to advertise to you. And Cambridge Analytica was one of those third-party developers. Unfortunately, they used the data that they collected in ways that people were not aware of and in ways that went against Facebook's terms of use. Cambridge Analytica was a political consulting firm hired by Donald Trump's campaign during his successful presidential run in 2016. The scandal was exposed in 2018, but the gathering of personal data from 87 million Facebook users without their consent happened a couple of years before. It was used to profile and target voters with digital ads that supported Donald Trump. So this was problematic and caused a huge controversy uh, globally. Uh, because nobody likes it when your data is used against you, especially if the people using the data uh, might have really problematic motives. There have been many, many more issues since then. These include anything from privacy problems, data privacy, to things like disinformation. So election manipulation on the platform, coronavirus conspiracies on the platform. We've also seen hate speech. We've seen a lot of bullying, cyber harassment, um, and worse on the Facebook platform and on Facebook's various other platforms as well. Just one of those problems would be enough to end other companies, but not this one. There have been a few times when advertisers have publicly pulled out. Uh, I remember during the Cambridge Analytica blowback, there were definitely uh, people who are saying they did not want to support a platform that allowed for potential election manipulation to happen. Uh, but again, this is all dependent on the consumer. If the consumers stay on the platform, uh, the advertisers are going to stay as well. So when things go wrong, as they have, who does the global force that is Facebook answer to? Well, it's complicated. One issue we're seeing here is the lack of accountability in big tech. Right now we have varying legal regimes. So the United States is rather permissive. There are regulations and there are laws that limit these companies, but they have a lot of freedom within the US. The EU and the UK have been stronger on regulating tech companies. Over the years, Facebook has paid out billions of dollars in legal settlements and fines. In December 2022, it agreed to pay $725 million to settle legal action over the Cambridge Analytica breach without admitting any wrongdoing. 
In January, it was fined over $400 million after Facebook and Instagram's advertising and data handling processes were found to have breached EU privacy laws. Facebook is facing many issues of regulatory and legal scrutiny right now. One issue that Facebook is facing in the United States is an upcoming duo of Supreme Court cases. And these deal specifically with internet platforms and their ability to use algorithms to recommend content to people. And more specifically, uh, these cases are about the recommendation or the showing of content that may be linked to terrorism. So this is a big problem sort of on the docket for Facebook, but also for other technology platforms. Fines apply to individual companies, but new laws to rein in Facebook will have wider consequences. Every internet platform has to deal with content moderation, online speech, and privacy problems. I think it's important to remember that sometimes we have regulations that seek to limit Facebook. But what happens is we don't just limit Facebook, we limit every tiny small startup. And we may even limit nonprofits, for example, like Wikipedia. During the early years, there was a trend for tech companies to have motivational slogans. Google's was, don't be evil, while over at Facebook, it was... Move fast and break things. That is such a Silicon Valley motto. And I think in recent years, though, they've learned a little bit that that doesn't always work out. I think as these big tech companies are maturing, they're realizing that they can't act the way they did when they were small startups. They have to work with regulators. They have to work with policymakers. They have to get consumers on their side. So this is a new phase for big tech. Part four, a new era. I think we've often kind of overemphasized really the decline of Facebook, at least as a platform. Of course, it's taken a reputational battering. Carl Miller is research director at the Centre for the Analysis of Social Media at Demos. But actually, for most normal people, it is an extremely meaningful place for them to be and therefore um, fills a place in people's lives and therefore we actually see it continue to grow. Also continuing to grow is TikTok. The video sharing app was the most downloaded in the world last year with 672 million downloads. It also has no problem attracting users aged between 18 to 24. It does seem to be one of the most significant challenges to uh, Facebook and the other tech giants that we've, that we've actually seen. It's clearly gaining uh, widespread adoption amongst um, the kinds of demographic groupings uh, that, that tend to be kind of uh, early signals of important shifts in social media use. But TikTok has problems of its own. Its Chinese ownership has triggered personal access data concerns, especially in the US. It's banned from federal devices and several college campuses. Some Republican and Democrat lawmakers are currently pushing for a nationwide ban. I think it's absolutely given now, not only that regulation is coming for big tech, but that it's already here. In the UK, we're about to roll out the online safety bill. And in the EU, there's been a whole fabric of different regulatory frameworks which have been employed. But we're, we're now moving into a new era, really, which is where they're going to have to conform to uh, the rules set by nation states and by the European Union. Massive but affordable corporate fines are a typical penalty for rule breakers. That could change. We saw with a recent parliamentary amendment, for instance, to the online safety bill, the idea that tech giant executives will actually be held criminally liable for some of the things happening on their platform. Uh, in the past, we've seen in Brazil, you know, a judge um, summon into court Facebook executives to ensure their compliance. So I think we, we probably will move into a, an era where it won't just be financial burdens, but there'll be other burdens placed on, on these companies in order to get them to conform as well. When social media platforms of any size decide what or who remains or is removed online, the risks and dangers of making the wrong call or doing nothing can be very real. For years, Meta's CEO Mark Zuckerberg has called on governments to increase internet regulation around areas including privacy, election integrity and harmful content. As they grew, they were having to make all these decisions 
about what's right and wrong, about what hate speech looks like, about what a terrorist organization is, that we're basically only really used to having public sector authorities really make. And I think that kind of thrust them into this position. And that's why probably this new age of regulation is, is good news for the tech giants, just as it's good news for the rest of us. Because suddenly, the people that we vote in as, as leaders are going to be responsible for making those decisions that the tech giants never really wanted to make. I don't think Facebook ever wanted to define what truth or lies are online. Meanwhile, in America... The oncoming presidential elections is going to be an enormous test for Facebook. What I think we can see uh, will be a kind of dogpile of all kinds of bad um, threat actors, as we call them in the research world. So be that campaigns, politicians or adversarial states, they're all going to try and use these big platforms to cast various kinds of covert and unseen influence over the voters. So how prepared is Facebook this time round? Facebook treats this issue, I think, a lot more seriously than it did back in 2016. It's spun up big, capable, clever teams of people. Like, are they doing a perfect job? No, no team can. But they will certainly search for a US presidential election, looking at the activity on their platform as carefully as possible. I think probably where things are less certain is, is whether they will actually change the basic, more underlying way that the, their platform actually works. Information warfare, disinformation, exploits um, some of the most kind of lizard parts of our brain. It really gets our hooks into our, our more primordial psychologies to, for instance, create virals which we share because we're really outraged or we think are really funny or we think are, uh, make us really angry. Carl Miller says Facebook could put the brakes on viral disinformation by doing things like limiting the amount of posts that can be shared or requesting more details from new accounts and ad clients. But of course that, that drives into one of the other priorities that Facebook has, which is to try and encourage as much growth and as much activity on the platform as they possibly can. 